I, I, has been so maligned and mixed up and confused that I uh, sometimes marvel. I wonder how uh, the truth of God can be so plain on the one hand and so uh, uh, destroyed and uh, uh, muddied, uh, confused by uh, lies and by untruths and by just a little bit of sleight of hand. One of the statements in Scripture by Ezekiel is that in the uh, end time, certainly in, in the time of uh, great disaster for the nation, uh, individuals would but deliver themselves by their own righteousness. There are two instances in the Bible or in the biblical record when persons were delivered from disaster by the righteousness of another. That uh, One of those <coughs> examples is uh, in the days of Noah, where his wife and his sons and uh, son and daughters-in-law were delivered because of the righteousness of Noah. And also the other instance of, of note is the example of Lot and his uh, wife and, and daughters. These are outstanding examples, and they show that uh, uh, in some cases, <coughs> certainly in ancient times, God did deliver uh, individuals because they were members of a family uh, from a uh, disaster, uh, from destruction. The story of Noah has been woven into the mythological Babylonian uh, system of religious beliefs in a most corrupted form. <clears throat> I uh, have a host of books on the subject of the Babylonian mystery uh, religion and uh, the mystery system, which uh, in every case point toward the inclusion of Noah as a major player and a major patriarch in the uh, Babylonian mystery religion. Today in the world, if you look in the world of religion, <clears throat> we see vestiges of the corrupted Babylonian religion uh, if we look behind it and understand it. For example, C.K. Barrett, in a book entitled The New Testament Background, uh, Selected Documents, page 91, says, and I quote, The object of the mystery cults was to secure salvation for men who were subject to moral and physical evil dominated by destiny and unable by themselves to escape from, uh, to escape accordingly uh, from destiny, to release them from corruption and a renewed moral life. It was affected by what may broadly be called sacramental means, this, this deliverance, this escape from, quote, destiny with a capital D. By taking part in prescribed rites, the worshiper became united with God, was enabled in this life to enjoy mystical communion with him, and further was assured of immortality beyond death. <clears throat> the myth, which seems often to have been cultically represented, rested in many of these religions upon the fundamental annual cycle of agricultural fertility but rights which probably were in earlier days intended to secure productiveness in field and flock were now given an individual application and effect. In, on page 96-97, under the subject of initiation, and, in, and specifically uh, uh, speaking of initiation into the uh, Mithraic religion, he says, and I quote, rites of initiation opened the way into membership of the cults and generally seemed to have consisted primarily of some ceremonial by means of which the initiand was incorporated into the divine action of the myth and so achieved life by virtue of the resurrection of the God. Uh, the Tarolium, as it is called, is case in point, uh, that was an end of the quote, by the way. The Torolium was a, um, <clears throat> the consecration of a priest of the great mother goddess uh, in which the initiate <clears throat> was showered by the blood of the sacrificial bull. I won't describe the elaborate system whereby uh, this was achieved, 
but suffice it to say that the <clears throat> priest who was being initiated was beneath the bull, spear was uh, thrust into the uh, chest uh, and heart of the bull, and he was showered with the blood uh, that, of course, purified him and consecrated him. And the consecrated priest, quote, emerging from the bloodbath with the gift of divine life drawn from the sacred bull, himself becomes divine. That is, this initiate, this consecrated priest, becomes divine and is therefore worshipped. Those who receive the taro bullium could be described as born again for eternity. Likewise, there are numerous references to being born again in other areas, <clears throat> or born again for eternity without regard to the initiate's uh, personal lifestyle, without regard to any change, any growth, any overcoming, <clears throat> any living according to uh, the way of God. Such nonsense <clears throat> was introduced into the uh, Church of God in the second century and gullible persons listened to this nonsense. <clears throat> they heard how similar uh, to the uh, teachings of the apostles, uh, Paul particularly, and uh, the New Testament apostles, they saw how similar some of these uh, systems were, and uh, they bought the lie. And from that day until now, we have people who believe uh, many of the religious practices which were brought from the system of Mithraism into Christianity. I'd like to quote the story of the Christian church by Hurlbut, Hurlbut <clears throat> H-U-R-L-B-U-T, chapter 9 <clears throat> on the imperial church. I won't uh, take go through the whole thing, but uh, let me pick up uh, on page 77, uh, after the conversion, as it is called, which was, uh, again, a big lie because uh, Constantine uh, really uh, was not converted. Uh, he was not even baptized into the uh, Christian religion of that time uh, until apparently in the uh, 330s A.D., and perhaps at the, about the time of his death, some say even on his deathbed that he did not request baptism, but that it was uh, performed uh, by the church for political reasons, and I, I guess not having been there, we couldn't judge on that uh, at all. However, in uh, after the... Uh, uh, success of uh, Constantine in his struggle against uh, the uh, other opponents, Maxentius in particular, uh, for the, um, uh, the um, uh, leadership of the Roman world, in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge over the Tiber River, about 10 miles out of Rome. Uh, after this conversion, <coughs> we read that uh, Constantine did not become sole emperor until 323 A.D. Now, the battle of uh, the Milvian Bridge, the famous battle, was in 312 A.D. So it took another, what, uh, 11 years before uh, Constantine was uh, the sole emperor. He was still struggling for power uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, we read <clears throat> that... Uh, at that point in time, 323 A.D., Constantine became sole emperor, and then Christianity was enthroned. Uh, in other words, uh, once the emperor was in sole power, then Christianity, uh, which uh, had wed, in effect, with the uh, uh, civil government and the civil side of, uh, of the uh, political spectrum, was now enthroned as well. Quoting Hurlbut, he says, Constantine's personal character was not perfect. Though generally just, he was occasionally cruel and tyrannical. Like after the victory at the, bat at the uh, Milvian Bridge, uh, he uh, uh, drowned, uh, apparently, his uh, opponent, Maxentius, 
so that uh, he would not he would cease to be an opponent. <clears throat> Good Christian conduct, I suppose. <clears throat> um, continuing on page seventy-seven of Hurlbut's uh, history of, of the Christian Church, the first day of the week was proclaimed as a day of rest and of worship, and its observance soon became general throughout the empire. In 321 A.D., Constantine forbade the courts to be held on Sunday, except for the purpose of giving freedom to slaves, and on that day soldiers were commanded to omit their daily military exercises. But the public games were continued on Sunday, tending to make it more of a holiday than a holy day. From the recognition of Christianity as the favored religion, some good results came to the people as well as to the church. The spirit of the new religion was infused into many of the ordinances enacted by Constantine and his immediate successors. Page 79, <clears throat> passing over some of the uh, alleged good things of uh, Constantine. Uh, we read, everybody sought membership in the church and nearly everybody was received, both good and bad. Sincere seekers after God and hypocritical seekers after gain rushed into the communion. Ambitious, worldly, unscrupulous men sought office in the church for social and political influence. The moral tone of Christianity and power is far below that which had marked the same people under persecution. The services of worship increased in splendor but were less spiritual and hearty than those of former times. The forms and ceremonies of paganism gradually crept into the worship. Some of the old heathen feasts became church festivals with change of name and of worship. About 405 A.D., images of saints and martyrs began to appear in the churches, at first as memorials and then in succession at revered, adored, and worshipped. The adoration of the Virgin Mary was substituted for the worship of Venus and Diana. The Lord's Supper became a sacrifice in place of a memorial, and the elder evolved from a preacher into a priest. Uh, one might see a little bit of anti-Catholic uh, uh, flavor in what <coughs> Dr. Hurlbut uh, has uh, said. Be that as it may, <coughs> it is true. Essentially, what he has recorded is borne out in every case uh, and from every uh, source, historical source that I know. Now, we're living in a time when church has gone through a very severe crisis and a very uh, severe upheaval through apostasy and uh, uh, heresy having been uh, taught, received, and inculcated into the church. And uh, we, I think, represent the uh, revival and the rebuilding of the work of God. At least we feel <clears throat> that we do and, and uh, that we are leading uh, and in the forefront of that, I don't say that to uh, uh, pat ourselves on the back because uh, certainly we are very weak. We're insignificant in power and in strength. Uh, but uh, I do believe <clears throat> that the heart and the soul uh, exists within the fellowship of the church as we know it and call it the global church of God. I think we're all very thankful to be a, a part of and have the opportunity to be in the work of God, which is leading up to, uh, we feel, the uh, very return of Jesus Christ. Recently on the news, I think it was CNN, uh, CNN I, I saw a re report of uh, the destruction that was wreaked on uh, the Caribbean uh, islands, uh, of various ones by uh, the uh, recent hurricanes, <clears throat> people whose whole lives were destroyed. And... Uh, in some cases, everything they owned was just wiped out and, and gone overnight by uh, uh, storms with wind of, what, 130 to 150 miles per hour, followed by uh, torrential rains and so on. It's very depressing to look at a uh, devastation, uh, destruction such as that, <clears throat> to look at it and say, uh, well, isn't this wonderful? Now we have an opportunity to rebuild. I think only a fool would look at uh, uh, destruction such as that and say that uh, this is just wonderful. It's just great that we have this opportunity to clean up 
the um, environment uh, and uh, and rebuild. That's that's ridiculous, and yet that's what has to be done. Uh, the same is true, I think, uh, in our personal lives. I don't think any one of us rejoices over the destruction and the uh, uh, the uh, dismantlement, if you please, of the structure of the Church of God, which uh, had uh, achieved a position uh, and a potential to preach the gospel in power, in great power and strength, to the entire world. History reveals <clears throat> that physical devastation of homes, workplace, environment, have been part of man's world from the beginning of time. There are seven major areas that mankind has to be concerned about. One is war from neighboring countries or powers. Uh, every country realizes there is a potential for an incursion uh, from uh, the neighboring uh, uh, countries, uh, the United States in particular, where we are, uh, has been very blessed in having <clears throat> on our north a friendly border, the longest border on earth that is essentially undefended militarily. Uh, the southern border has been relatively uh, secure and stable uh, throughout uh, our history. And so uh, we as a people have been very, very greatly blessed. But war from neighboring countries, as we can see in Europe and, uh, and Asia, and other parts of the world, uh, is a major uh, worry, a concern for every people on earth. Number two is famine. This may be due to drought, disease, uh, uh, pestilence, whatever. Uh, three is pestilence, whether by insects, rodents, whatever it may be. Uh, mankind has always had to struggle and fight against incursions and uh, the devastation caused by locust swarms and other pestilences. Disease. Uh, <clears throat> we know of instances, and I, I intended uh, or considered bringing a um, uh, story that I have from Paul Harvey uh, about the um, uh, instance of uh, plague, which uh, I think it was yellow fever, which struck the capital of the United States following our Civil War. I'm sorry, our war, a Revolutionary War. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, how people died by the hundreds and the thousands. And, I, and the, the city of Philadelphia was just devastated by disease or by plagues. Uh, number five, natural disasters, so-called a fire and flood, uh, such as from hurricanes and tornadoes and from uh, flooding, such as we have had uh, even recently in our country, in, in uh, the, the, the great river uh, drainage basins of uh, the Mississippi and the uh, Missouri River, natural disasters, so-called, of fire and flood. Um, recently, we had a, a serious fire here in Southern California, which threatened some of the homes of some of you. And uh, perhaps <clears throat> if uh, the truth is really known, there was uh, some rather miraculous deliverance. We had a case last year of a member in uh, Oregon whose home was in the path of a, uh, a fire that was just totally out of control. The fire burned up to his home, burned a few and scorched some of the fence posts of his property, which was right smack in the middle of the path of this uh, firestorm, and the fire stopped, went around his property, and uh, it burned some uh, brush, <clears throat> some uh, an area, I think about five acres or so, of his, his property that he wanted to clear. Uh, he was planning to, uh, to, to clear it off and put it in the pasture or whatever. It burned that and destroyed the uh, the brush on it, but uh, it just just scorched the bark on some of the, the large trees on his property. Uh, he happened to be out of town at the time, Mr. Don Haney. 
and uh, he was told by phone that his property was gone, uh, everything was gone, everything was burned up because the fire had overrun their property. When he got home, and uh, the uh, con- the authorities opened up the uh, the road into his place. Uh, they were already talking about that place, that place which was like a horseshoe, which had been miraculously spared from the fire. And when he went in, he found his property totally secure and totally spared. Uh, Natural disasters of fire, natural disasters of flood, these are problems which we all have to contend with and worry about, be concerned about. Number six is internal violence, natural to society. I don't know if you saw the news last week <clears throat> in Los Angeles, the little, uh, the family that made a wrong turn went into an alley and ended up uh, uh, being uh, attacked by a gang. The uh, three-year-old daughter, I believe, was uh, killed and a little child was wounded. Uh, the father was uh, wounded and uh, perhaps by virtue of uh, just determination and and reflex, uh, they were not all killed. Internal violence from uh, madmen and from individuals who have no conscience, no compunction whatsoever. This is as old as history itself. It's been a part of humanity from time immemorial. And finally, domestic violence resulting from uh, home uh, life from a husband who is, uh, for whatever reason, uh, becomes abusive uh, to his wife or his children or uh, because of uh, uh, problems, uh, because of an individual in the marriage being unfaithful, how often do we see where violence erupts and one or the other is dead? These are all part of living... And um, they're all common to man. I think the first of these, war, famine, pestilence, and disease, <clears throat> are um, the great uh, the great persecutions and and destroyers of humanity. And they've been a part of the human story from the days of Cain when he slew his brother Abel. <clears throat> you know, every country goes through a cycle, a cycle of birth, beginning with a uh, a patriarch, with a a very strong man. I could list uh, uh, case after case after case, historically, where uh, a a people became great uh, from a very small clan or a very small family, and eventually they possessed uh, great vigor and power, and uh, they achieved a place in... uh, on, on the uh, <clears throat> in the scheme of things, uh, they became a very major force in uh, society at large. <clears throat> you know, Israel, the nation, the descendants of Abraham, Israel was offered an incredible opportunity by God to be free of the uh, political disasters, at least, and even of the so-called natural disasters as she entered the promised land. She was offered a unique position among the nations of the earth if she would simply obey God and follow him. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, and in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, and in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 18, we are told over and over again three times in the Old Testament, which is significant, because three signifies finality. Three times God told Israel they were an holy nation. They were a holy people. They were a special treasure. They were his special people, chosen by him to be a people for himself, that they should keep all his commandments. Because the commandments of God and obedience to the way of God produces the fruit of peace. That is, absence of war, absence of all of these seven major evils that that, uh, seem to be uh, a part of every society's history and 
and uh, experience. Not only that, but in the New Testament, there are a number of scriptures. I will cite only sec- uh, first. I'm sorry, Titus chapter two and verse fourteen, where we read that uh, he Christ gave himself for us, <clears throat> that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been called out of the chaos, the confusion, the garbage, if you please, of this society. God gave us his system. God gave us his way just as he gave it to Israel of old. They didn't obey. We have seen in our time how quickly many will turn from that way to the way of the world that is embraced by the world. God warned Israel through Moses at the time of Moses' death that the same evils which the nations experienced, the nations around them experienced, would fall upon the children of Israel if they did not heed the warning that he gave. If they fell into the idolatrous religious practices of the nations and of those people who were uh, the inhabitants of the land of Palestine, the uh, Canaanites, the various tribes of the Canaanites. I am persuaded that the Canaanites had had the true religion given to them and the truth of God had been known to them. When we inspect, when we look at the religions of uh, the, the Baal worship itself, Baal meaning Lord, and Baalat meaning uh, the lady, <clears throat> if you please, uh, the, the religion of the Canaanites, I believe, was a uh, perversion and corruption of the truth of God which had been given to those people, perhaps uh, from their ancestor and uh, going back to Seth, following the flood. The question is, how can Satan lure a people as Israel was who are promised such wonderful promises if they only obey God, if they will only look to God and not turn to idolatry? How can Satan lure a people with those promises into idolatry. I think we can see how he did it by examining what has happened in our day. I ask you, how could Satan deceive God's people into giving up their assurance of deliverance from Satan's destructive acts in the end time? Think on it. There are many people And I have heard the comment, I have heard repeatedly now for about 20 years, it started about 1973, I have heard many people say, oh, well, the being spared, being taken to a place of refuge, a place of safety, is not really that important. That's not really important. Uh, People have have uh, tried to imply that to look for, to expect the promised deliverance from this great tribulation that was even referred to in the sermonette, that there's something evil about looking for, hoping for, waiting for, expecting deliverance. Oh, you're just, uh, you're just trying to save your own skin, people have said. You know, if that skin is about to be stripped off your back, it becomes a lot more significant. 
when your skin is about to be burned, it really becomes significant to save it. And yet it, it, the first step in the, in the deception was discounting, if you please, the promise of God. Putting it down, cheapening it, making it as if, oh well, you're looking to save your own skin. That's, uh, you know, that's just, that's just, uh, I mean, after all, uh, you know, the real important thing is the spiritual aspect of, of uh, looking for uh, the kingdom. And, and people got their eyes turned away. They bought that, and it was a, in a sense, it was true. If an individual is seeking to save his, his uh, physical skin and physical uh, life, if that alone is the objective, sure it's wrong. Certainly it's not, not correct. But on the other hand, it is significant because it's a promise from God to those who obey him and those who are doing his work. And who are we to discount a promise from God which he considers important and significant? In Deuteronomy chapter 31, we have the story of, of Moses when he was... Uh, speaking to uh, Israel just before they were crossing Jordan, Deuteronomy 31, 1, and following verses. Verse 3, he said, But the Lord himself will lead you, because I'm not able to go across, and will destroy the nations living there, and you shall overcome them. Joshua is your new commander, as the Lord has instructed the Lord will destroy the nations living in the land, just as he de uh, destroyed Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites. The Lord will deliver over to you the people living there, and you shall destroy them as I have commanded you. Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God will be with you. He will neither fail you nor forsake you. And then verse 9, this was written after he had once again reiterated in verse 7 and 8 to Joshua the importance of of courage, of being strong, of, of standing firm, and being courageous, and leading God's people faithfully. Verse 9, Then Moses wrote out the laws he had already delivered to the people, and gave them to the priests, the son of Levi. You know, the, the, the common attitude, the common story, the common idea out there in the world is that, no, Moses didn't write this. This was, this was something that was written by the priests, perhaps even as late as, and certainly most likely after, the Babylonian captivity. And, of course, <clears throat> then the priests and the Levites uh, inserted this uh, into the, the, the biblical story and the biblical record because it gave them power over the people, the, the, over the, the, this uh, nation or the, the people of, uh, of God. Scripture says Moses wrote out the law as he had already delivered to the people and gave them to the priests. And uh, the priests put them in the ark, as he had instructed. Verse 10, The Lord commanded that these laws be read to all the people at the end of every seventh year, the year of release, at the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel would assemble before the Lord at the sanctuary. Now, I understand <clears throat> this is at the end of the seventh year in the, in the uh, year of release, the sabbatical year. Uh, it seems, uh, if, if one looks at this scripture alone, that perhaps uh, the, the other six years they were not obligated to come up to uh, the tabernacle, up to Jerusalem uh, to worship. But not so. When we look at all of the scriptures together, we understand that this was to be a special occasion and that these words were to be read, these laws were to be read every seventh year because of the importance and the significance and as a reminder of their deliverance out of the land of Egypt. That it, it, The seventh year, the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh year was to be a very special festival to them and that there was to be a special reminder of that deliverance at the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh year. Call them all together, verse 12, the Lord instructed, 
men, women, children, and foreigners living among you to hear the laws of God and to learn his will so that you will reverence the Lord your God and obey his laws. Do this so that your little children who have not known these laws will hear them and learn how to revere the Lord your God as long as you live in the promised land. There was an objective here. The, the object was to instruct, to teach, to learn. Verse, six, verse 15, so he appeared to Joshua and Moses in the cloud at the tabernacle entrance. In verse 16, Moses said, I'm sorry, God said to Moses, you shall die and join your ancestors. And after you are gone, these people will begin worshiping foreign gods in the promised land. They will forget about me and break the contract I have made with them. Then my anger will flame out against them. And here's how his anger would be affected. Here's what would happen. My anger would flame out against them, and they shall be destroyed when I will abandon them, hiding my face from them. When God removes his protection, you are vulnerable. His people are vulnerable. The nation of Israel was vulnerable because God turned his face away from them to deliver, protect them from the seven great areas of concern and fear and worry. We, we get our punishment. We, we are punished when we turn away from God, when we walk away from God, we lose that contact with God, and then the punishment is automatically be, automatic because we have severed ourselves from, from him. And he then is cut off from us, and he severs himself. He said, and they shall be destroyed. Terrible trouble will come upon them, so that they will say, ha, ah, then they will, they will begin to put it together and say, God is no longer among us. They turn from the path. They, they opted to walk away from God. They turn to the idols, to the false gods of the land. And then they recognize something has happened. God is no longer among us. How did they recognize it? Because of the evils that came upon them. God said to Moses, through Moses, this you will recognize because of the physical consequences. I will turn away from them because of their sins and worshiping other gods. And so Moses was told to write down the words of this song, teach it to the people as a warning to them. And great disasters, verse 21, will come upon them. Then this song will remind them of the reason for their woes. For this song will live from generation to generation. I know now, even before they enter the land, what these people are like. <clears throat> what we are like is very clear because of what we portray in our attitude and by our conduct. When Moses had finished writing down all the laws that are recorded in this book, verse 24... He instructed, verse 25, the Levites who carried the ark containing the Ten Commandments to put this book of the law beside the ark as a solemn warning to the people of Israel. Verse 27, <clears throat> For I know how rebellious and stubborn you... Now, um, my question is, is he referring to the Levites? Or is he referring to the people? Or is re he referring to both? He instructed the Levites who carried the ark to put this book of the law beside the ark as a solemn warning to the people of Israel. Quote, verse 27, For I know how rebellious and stubborn you, people and priests, like people, like priests, how stubborn you are, Moses told them. If even today, while I am still here with you, you are defiant rebels against the Lord, how much more rebellious will you be after my death? 
And then he summoned all the elders and officers of the tribes, to, and he said to them, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. Verse 29, I know that after my death you will utterly defile yourselves and turn away from God and his commands, and in the days to come evil will crush you, for you, you will do what the Lord says is evil, making him very angry. And Moses recited this entire song to the whole assembly of Israel. Verse 30. And they didn't heed. They were warned. You know, it's very discouraging. After 40 years of his life, <clears throat> after 40 years of teaching and working with those people to see the potential for those people to be a great and powerful people in the land which God had given. Palestine was the crossroads of civilization, as it were, in those days. They were sitting in the most powerful, the potentially most powerful place on earth to control commerce. And the intercourse between the nations from the east and the west, from the south and the north. And they blew it. And so it continues to this day, and so it shall be in the future. Now, when it comes to reward and punishment from God, I ask you, today, will a coattail religion suffice? Can, can one just hang on to the coattail of the minister or of mother or father or of an individual, whoever it may be, that one looks to as a spiritual guide and leader? Can any of us cling to an individual and on the basis of clinging to an individual, holding to an individual, put our trust and our confidence and our hope for the future, whether of this life or of life to eternity, can we place it upon floating along and being there because we are associated with and close to a good person, a leader. History says no. Israel, after 400 years, became a great nation under King David. You know that historically. And following David, <clears throat> King Solomon ruled in a time of peace and became uh, the nation of Israel, uh, reached her... Uh, highest uh, uh, potential, uh, perhaps, ever, certainly in, in that world. A couple hundred, uh, about 250 years later, Israel was dragged, that is, the northern kingdom, after having had a uh, rebellion of the uh, ten tribes to the north. Those ten tribes were dragged from the land in captivity by the Assyrians. And Judah remained, but Judah suffered adversities, and finally, beginning about the time of Nebuchadnezzar's wars in the West in 606 B.C., uh, it was the uh, beginning of the end for Judah. Finally, in 585, as you know, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and took away, uh, led away the captives after having destroyed uh, and uh, taken the treasures out of the temple, Solomon's beautiful temple. It was a time when the people were chastened, but they were not totally conquered at heart. They were defeated in the field, <clears throat> but when we read the story of Jeremiah in particular, we find that they were a people who were broken. They were a people devastated physically, but they were not a people who were repentant. Even those who were left behind in the land, the ones, actually it seems, that the ones who were more contrite and repentant were among those who were taken into captivity and suffered adversity first in the earliest phase of that captivity. It 
Ezekiel chapter 14 gives us the story. A portion of Judah was taken into captivity when Nebuchadnezzar invaded the land, as you know, in the beginning of his western campaigns. And then we read some of the elders of Israel, Ezekiel 14.1, visited me to ask me for a message from the Lord. And this is the message that came to me to give them. Son of dust, these men worship idols in their hearts. Should I let them ask me anything? Idols in their hearts. Now, it's one thing to have idols uh, externally out there. We we all would recognize, I, I guess, uh, an idol that was out there, but an idol in here? They had idols in their hearts, and, and those idols are the ones most difficult to discern and perhaps the most difficult to eradicate. You tell them, the Lord God says, I, the Eternal, will personally deal with anyone in Israel who worships idols and then comes to ask my help. God is not pleased and he is not satisfied with those who come to him and ask for help but have their idols set up in their own hearts and will not relinquish that that hold and that con- that control those idols have over their hearts and minds. Tell them, I will personally deal with anyone in Israel who worships idols and then comes to ask my help. For I will punish the minds and hearts of those who turn from me to idols. Therefore warn them, says the eternal God, repent and destroy your idols and stop worshiping them in your hearts. The problem God knew and Ezekiel understood, the problem was in their hearts. And I, the eternal, will punish personally punish everyone, whether people of Israel or the foreigners living among them, who rejects me for idols and then comes to a prophet to ask my help and advice. I will turn upon him and make a terrible example of him, destroying him. And you shall know I am the eternal. And if one of the false prophets gives him a message anyway, it's a lie. His prophecy will not come true, and I will stand against that prophet and destroy him from among my people Israel. False prophets and hypocrites, evil people who say they want my words, all will be punished for their sins, so that the people of Israel will look. would be saved by their righteousness. And I would destroy the remainder says of Israel, says the Eternal. If I send an invasion of dangerous wild animals into the land to devastate the land, even if these three men were there, the Lord God swears that it, it would do them no good. It would not, I'm sorry, it would do no good. It would not save the people from their doom. Those three only would be saved, but the land would be devastated. Or if I bring war against that land and tell the armies of the enemy to come and destroy everything, even if these three men were in the land, the Lord God declares that they alone would be saved. If I pour out my fury by sending an epidemic of disease into the land and the plague kills man and beast alike, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were living there, the Lord God says that they only would be saved because of their righteousness. And the Lord says, Four great punishments await Jerusalem to destroy all life, war, famine, ferocious beasts, plagues. If there are survivors and they come here to join you as exiles in Babylon, you will see with your own eyes how wicked they are, and you will know it was right for me to destroy Jerusalem. You will agree when you meet them that it is not without cause that all these are being done to Israel, all these things. Now, It's interesting to watch 
what happens and what has been happening in the church of God. It is interesting to see how much <clears throat> coattail clinging has gone on in recent times. It's, uh, it's quite significant to see how many people have been following on the coattail of men and how many people have chosen to make decisions on the basis of an elder, of a leading minister, of a man of standing and of reputation. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 12 of uh, <coughs> uh, the, the story of the uh, breakup of the nation of Israel into two kingdoms. And you know the story and how uh, there was a uh, uh, Jeroboam, the, uh, the, the man, who, the general, the, the uh, military leader, who led off the ten. And as time went on, uh, he, uh, he established a religion. And uh, he knew that <clears throat> if the uh, uh, people continued to go down to Judah, to uh, Jerusalem, to offer sacrifices, he understood that the people would would tend, and in their hearts they would continue to affiliate with the house of David. Therefore, he determined that it was expedient to just tweak the religion a little bit, and so he established a priesthood, as the scripture says, from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. As another place, it says <clears throat> he made priests of anyone who chose, anyone who opted, anyone who would step forward and ask. And he, of course, ordained the feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices. And he did this the following month after the Feast of Tabernacles. And in one instance, he was standing at the uh, uh, altar at Bethel, and he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, uh, after uh, this sign had been given uh, by this uh, the, the uh, faithful servant of God, that the altar would split apart and ashes on it would be poured out and so on when he was offering a sacrifice. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. And then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And so the king repented immediately and said, Let's all go down to Jer... I'm sorry, uh, it never happened. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And so the man entreated and the king's hand was restored and became as before. And then the king said to the man, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place, for it is so commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went out another way, and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. And so all was well. The prophet had carried out his duty, his function, and Jeroboam had had a witness. Jeroboam had tried to buy him off, and he had refused. Great, wonderful man. Now, <clears throat> he went on his way, and there was an old prophet in, who dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came, told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king, and their father said, Well, which way did he go? And his sons, uh, for his sons had seen which way the man of God went when he came from, who came from Judah. And he said, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled him, and he went after the man of God and found him under, sitting under an oak tree. The man got tired and decided to rest a while. And uh, he uh, sat down to, uh, uh, rather than moving right on ahead and uh, 
getting out of that place. And he said, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, yes, I am. And he said, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water, water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the eternal, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, but I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water, which was diametrically contrary, opposite to what his instructions had been, what his commission was. Of course, parenthetically, he was lying to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now then, here's an old prophet of God, a man who might be a counterpart to a servant of God in our day, who has standing, who has a position, who has a reputation, and who would, in effect, lie to a servant of God or people of God, and in effect tell them, eat, drink, and be merry, all will be well. It is all going to turn out well with you. Well, <clears throat> while they were eating at his table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back, and he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Now, it may be, it may be that in his mind, this lying prophet, this, this old prophet, actually did believe that he heard something from an angel of the Lord. I don't know. But says he was lying. Well, he cried out to this man, Thus says the Eternal, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread and drank water, in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water, your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. You know the story, how he left there a lion on, a, on an ass, the lion slew him, the lion and the donkey stood. This is abnormal, obviously. Normally, <clears throat> while the lion would be destroying the man, the donkey would be down there, as far away as possible. But not so. They found the donkey by the man. And the lion lying by the man as a witness and a testimony to them. I think it is very important for us to understand the lesson to each and every minister of God, some of whom may be hearing this by tape. I say to you, we must examine ourselves very carefully, each of us, us asking himself, am I pointing God's people toward repentance? Am I encouraging those who approach me to set up or embrace idols within their own hearts? Am I suggesting to them that they cannot, must not, should not abide by the instruction, the teaching, concerning such significant issues or matters as the leadership of the church of God. I should ask myself, am I a hireling? Am I a priest of convenience, as were the priests of Jeroboam, and as those in the days of Jeremiah? or Ahab, those who withstood the servants of God over and over again and who spoke the truth, those, that is, who spoke the truth without compromise. You know the story. You've read the story of the prophets who withstood Jeremiah and the prophets 
who stood before King Ahab. Excellent lessons for us today. Now, there are some New Testament examples which we ought to consider. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter wrote to the church, and he said, This is my second letter to you, dear brothers, and in both of them I have tried to remind you, if you'll let me, about facts you already know. Facts you learned from the holy prophets and from us apostles who brought you the words of our Lord and Savior. First, I want to remind you that in the last days there will come scoffers who will do every wrong they can think of and laugh at the truth. How many times do we find the dichotomy as between the lie and the truth? Convenience and the truth. Selfishness, idolatry, and the truth. It is always as opposed to the truth. Truth is where it's at because truth represents and reflects the living God and his son, Jesus Christ, almighty God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. They are truth. Their very character and nature is truth. None of this peeping and muttering and this, this mystery and this, this hidden stuff. That's all from that Babylonian religion and that, of course, from Satan the devil. <clears throat> this will be their line of argument from the living Bible. <clears throat> this will be their line of argument. So, Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? Kind of like, oh, well, God has promised to, uh, uh, a place uh, of deliverance and safety for, uh, for those in the end time in the great tribulation. Well, <laughs> yes, but, but are, are you really, are you trying to, to earn your deliverance and are you just trying to save your own skin? Is, is what, are you just obeying God just to save your own skin? Oh, my, that's terrible. Oh, is it? I, I think it's, it, it might not be the ultimate reason, obviously. There's a greater purpose. But when your skin's on fire, <clears throat> that's good enough reason to obey God or to make one wish he had obeyed God, perhaps better said. And so, again, so Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? He'll never come. Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly as it was since the first day of creation. I've heard those very that very expression in a little different words. Oh, everything is just one endless cycle. Just all that has been is what shall be, and there is nothing new under the sun. They deliberately forget this fact, verse 5, that God did destroy the world with a mighty flood long after he had made the heavens by the word of his command and had used the waters to form the earth and surround it. And God had commanded that the truth and the heavens be stored away for a great bonfire at the judgment day when all ungodly men will perish. But don't forget this, dear friends, that a day or a thousand years from now is like tomorrow to the Lord. He isn't really being slow about his promised return, even though it sometimes seems that way. I love this, this paraphrase version. I'll just love it. Uh, in, in areas where it's not doctrinally uh, critical, I, I, I enjoy the, the living Bible. <clears throat> but he is waiting for the good reason that he is not willing that any should perish, and he is giving more time for sinners to repent. The day of the Lord is surely coming as unexpectedly as a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the heavenly bodies will disappear and fire, and the earth and everything on it will be burned up. And so, since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy, godly lives we should be living. You should look forward to that day and hurry it along the day when God will set the heavens on fire and the heavenly bodies will melt and disappear in flames 
but we are looking forward to God's promises of new heavens and a new earth afterward, where there, there will be only goodness. That's the world to come. Dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen and for him to come, try hard to live without sinning and be at peace with everyone so that he will be pleased with you when he returns. And remember why he is waiting. He is giving us time to get this, his message of salvation out to others. <clears throat> Our wise and beloved brother Paul has talked about these same things in many of his letters. Some of his comments are not easy to understand, and there are people who are deliberately stupid. Boy, what a way of translating that. <clears throat> there are people who are deliberately stupid and always demand some unusual interpretation. They have twisted his letters around to mean something quite different from what he meant, just as they do the other parts of the Scriptures, and the result is disaster for them. I'm warning you ahead of time, dear brothers, so that you can watch out and not be carried away by the mistakes of these wicked men, lest you yourselves become mixed up too, but grow in spiritual strength and become better acquainted with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be all glory and splendor, honor, both now and forever. Goodbye. The Apostle John, <clears throat> in both, all three, of, well, particularly the first two epistles, he wrote, warned again and again and again in 1 John chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 4 and on and on that deceivers were going to come out. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. And any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, that, but that you may be rewarded fully. And anyone who runs ahead... Now, this is an interesting translation of this. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. I checked this in some other, <coughs> uh, other uh, definitions and, and uh, translations, and it's rather interesting. Uh, this... Uh, uh, this idea of running ahead is um, is kind of the same as uh, what Daniel speaks of in uh, Daniel chapter 12, where he talks about the time of the end when uh, there would be a knowledge would be increased. You, you know, you're familiar with. It. Maybe I ought to read it because it's a it's as if he is paraphrasing uh, Daniel chapter 12. I. I think. Daniel chapter 12, <clears throat> at the time of the end, verse 1, and so on. Your people shall be delivered, those who are written and found written in the book. Verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, the significant verse is verse 4. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. Now this uh, in the Hebrew is apostatize. The Hebrew should means to rove, turn about, despise, or those who turn aside, or revolters. Almost as if Peter is paraphrasing Daniel 12.4. Those who run about, those who run ahead, those who, who run here and there and try to uh, add to and to, to enlarge upon the instruction of God and, and uh, like the Gnostics did. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Jesus Christ does not have God and whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. There's uh, <clears throat> translating this in the New International Version. For if you wander beyond the teaching of Christ, you will leave God behind. I, I think the other uh, version had those who run ahead. Anyone who runs ahead. New International Version says... 
if you wander beyond the teaching of Christ, you will leave God behind. While if you are loyal to Christ's teaching, you will have God too. Then you will have both the Father and the Son. Very important, I think, uh, that particular verse. Uh, chapter, I'm sorry, Jude chapter 1, verse 4. Jude, only one chapter, anyway, 1, 4. <clears throat> For certain men... Uh, whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a lie, or uh, into license for immorality, and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And then I could give you a whole host of uh, uh, definitions of the, the uh, Greek terms and Greek words here, but I think you know uh, that uh, what it, it is saying, and I don't have to uh, emphasize that. I could point out Lang's commentary and <clears throat> tell you some nonsense, but that wouldn't help you either, not really. It would just be more of the same. We do find <clears throat> that in the apostolic church, that um, uh, there was, there were those who introduced the lie, and initially the uh, uh, church at Ephesus, as we read in Revelation chapter two, verse two, <clears throat> he speaks highly of Ephesus. He said, "I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men." that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. So they tested and found them, another verse, another translation has found them liars. Verse 14, to the church at Pergamum, he said, verse 14, Revelation 2, 14, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. In other words, they allowed an individual to come into the church and keep working on uh, and and striving to to subvert individuals within the church and entice them to sin. In this case, into idolatry. Verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, he said, verse 20, you have something that... I don't like there. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess by her teaching. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I, I personally am of the opinion this is referring to the Babylonian uh, uh, religion and uh, those who were perpetrating that within, uh, even within the church of God, <clears throat> and that when we see the great persecutions that did ensue, uh, the people of God, for the most part, fled and were out of that system and out of that mess, I suspect. And I think that when we read Fox's Book of Martyrs, we're reading, for the most part, not altogether, but for the most part, we are reading about... Uh, the, what he warned and, and what he, uh, what God said would come upon this, uh, Jezebel and, uh, those who would uh, not repent of her ways. But, uh, that's neither here nor there, I guess. He does say finally, though, in verse 23, <clears throat> uh, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. That is sure. That is certain. God says so. We will be repaid according to our deeds. Well, in summary, let me sum up. God gave his truth, <clears throat> revealed it in the written word. We have that word. We're told that the word of God, the Old Testament, is written for our learning, our admonition, our exhortation. The New Testament is a, is a continuum of the old. It's building upon the foundation of the old. Not 
notwithstanding what some others have recently written and published and stated uh, to that contrary. God implemented a system based on truth which would teach his children and their children. That system of truth was cast away and was discounted, disregarded, and has continued to be disregarded by humanity. Truth is eternal. Truth never changes. Truth is constant. God speaks truth. Christ is judging each and every one of us day by day by our decisions. Stroke by stroke, each decision we make leads to the next condition and the next decision on that condition which then is going to lead us all, each of us, and all of us collectively to the final judgment. We are judging ourselves, brethren, and our brethren out there are judging themselves by decisions being made and actions which follow and by the consequences followed by more decisions and more actions, more consequences. The incremental doctrinal adjustments, not really changes, we were told, but just doctrinal adjustments instituted by the leaders in the church of God have deceived many because they decided once and then twice and then perhaps once again to accept the logic which was initially founded upon a lie. And once one began saying yes to Satan, as Eve did. The path is just greased to destruction. I don't know if you, <clears throat> any of you ever boxed or wrestled or whatever, but I have. When I was young, I, I for some reason, ended up in the ring frequently. <clears throat> our, our principal in our school... Our superintendent had a policy. Anybody who got into a fight on the school ground, if they were not too large, if they were too big, the principal or superintendent would watch the fight because <clears throat> he didn't want to get in between, you know, and, and get hurt. <clears throat> but if the little guys, like uh, most of us, they would come and drag us down to the gym, put big gloves on us. <clears throat> And we had to fight until one or the other gave up or we dropped. One thing I learned a long time ago in, in that experience is that <clears throat> once you're pushed off balance, once you start moving backward, you are at a tremendous disadvantage. You, you have to, to maintain, stay on your toes, as it were, on the balls of your feet, Maintain your balance, and you dance, and you move around, but you don't let them start getting you on uh, backing up and backtracking. Satan, the devil, is the author, and he has fainted, and he has stri uh, struck, and he has smitten the people of God and gotten them off balance, and they, they fell victim to the logic which was based upon a lie. Once, twice, again, and again. And many of our brethren have accepted one part or two, one doctrine or more of those, unfortunately, sadly, and they are so vulnerable to total destruction. It's our job to try to help them to understand it. For those in the ministry, it is our job I don't care what organization we are in. It is our job to help God's people to understand and recover. And recover themselves from the devastation, the destruction that is to, about to happen. The church, collectively, and we individually, are going to be judged 
and we are judged by our actions, by our conduct, and we are not going to slide in because some individual whom we respect and have high regard for simply says, it's okay, don't worry, just accept it, go along. For now, it'll all turn out all right, because it won't. 